Good day. This is Carol Stimmel in the Angerati studio at European Utility Week 2015. Uh, today, we're uh, meeting with our panel of experts to discuss the idea of 100% renewable penetration. Uh, with me today, I have Monet, Remy, and Julian. Uh, first, what we'll do is we'll go around and have some proper introductions from these gentlemen, and then we're going to dive right into this topic and discuss the, the benefits and challenges of, of moving aggressively towards this, this desire. Sure. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot, Carol, for having us. I'm Monet de Pratere. I'm a European Power Analyst at uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Um, Bloomberg New Energy Finance is a team of about 200 experts tracking the changes in the energy, energy sector. Uh, and myself, I'm looking at power markets and how they are changing as a response to more renewables. Okay, great. Thank you for being here. Remy. Hello, I'm Remy Garek, working for uh, ERDF. ERDF is the uh, French distribution system operator, and we are in charge of 95% of uh, efforts. And in ERDF, I'm a smart grid project manager, especially uh, coordinating the grid for you project, which is uh, one of the biggest smart grid projects in the world. Right, thank you, Remy. Julian. Thanks, Carol. Um, I'm Julian Wayne. I've recently left Ofgem, the GB network and market regulator, to join RES, uh, an international developer. I focus on developing energy storage projects in the GB market. Okay, so this is a very nice cross-section to discuss this. I'm actually quite excited about being able to bring in the economics of the question, too, because um, up until recently, it's we've been looking at how to bring down costs related to technology, and then we've looked at things like, um, you know, the right mix, how to bring them onto the grid. It, what's happening now, especially with um, what we've learned from Germany, are we we're, we're grappling with new financing schemes. We're grappling with the idea that the value of an electron is changing, and we're grappling with ideas like energy security and reliability. And these are, these are issues that are quite core um, to the question. So the idea of 100% penetration renewables, uh, I don't, you know, all of a sudden that came out of nowhere. A couple of years ago it was like if we can get to 80% that would be huge. Um, but we've had island projects, we've now seen uh, remote microgrids taking off, areas where there's been severe energy poverty now being electrified, so it's a really, really exciting time. The benefits for renewables make a lot of sense. They make a lot of sense. But when, when the rubber hits the road, things get a little tougher. So just today, I read in the paper that Germany is now at 30%. And in the popular imagination, I think we all think that's a lot higher, that they've been operating a lot higher. But there have been challenges there, too. And um, when you read articles about this, this move towards renewables, that's all it says. There have been challenges. But let's talk about what those challenges are. Let's start on the economic side. What are you seeing? Um, well, I guess a couple of things, really, um, and, and I want to highlight two. Um, first of all, challenges for the conventional generation, right? coal plants, gas plants. Um, are struggling because they are losing run hours. They're not running as often as they used to. And uh, I mean, added to that, power demand is in decline. So I mean, overall, it's a bad spot to be in for mm -hmm. a thermal generator. Um, and I mean, we forecast these things out and, and we look at sort of uh, margins for gas plants and coal plants. And I mean, actually, the stuff that has to balance out variable renewables. And I think what we see is that um, under the current market structure, these are just not profitable anymore. Um, and, and the thing is, we'll need them. So, so what you're going to do there? I mean, obviously, Germany is reforming its market. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a whole set of proposals uh, that should have some effect. But the qu big question is, like, is it, is it going to be enough? Um, and I think on the renewables side, there's probably issues as well, um, because there's, um, there's some sort of a, a strategy of, of or, or long-term view that eventually renewables should come off, renew uh, should mm -hmm. come off subsidies. Sorry. Um, Quite, quite quickly, actually. Quite, I mean, quite but, quickly. They're already sort of on the. With the United path. States, they're shooting for within the next five years. Yeah. So it's really aggressive. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but we we don't see really that mm -hmm. happening anytime soon because renewables have this kind of effect of depressing their own power price. When you have a lot of wind, when you have a lot of solar, um, I mean, they flood the market and the power price collapses in those hours that they are generating. Um, so there's kind of an issue as well with profitability. So, I mean, overall, you're going to need to see a different market uh, if, if you want to see the whole system work. 
Well, you're talking about the economic piece, but really that's that's a direct impact of, you know, the renewables spilling and, um, you know, the whole management piece. So t talk to us a little bit about the, the more technical pieces, if you will. First, for, for um, when we talk to renewables and 100% renewable, you probably need to make the difference between 100% renewables, like in Norway, where uh, nearly 98 or 99 percent of the mix is coming from big hydro. There, there is a huge dam providing mm -hmm. nearly every, every electron using Norway. And 100 percent of distributed renewable. If you want to, in Norway, it works perfectly fine with nearly 100 percent renewable since a long time ago. But if we uh, want to have a look at what could be the next uh, grid or the coming grid with 100% of distributed renewable, like solar panel on your roof, or, or smaller wind farm, or, or some power to gas installation, this is uh, not, the, not the same. And in this case, this is the big difference when we talk about uh, a mix reaching 100% renewable. The role played by the grid is, is much more different. Right. Well, Julian, what's your response to that? You seem to be, you know, concurring, but I also know you, that you have some other concerns regarding reliability, and you know, we've talked a little bit about this offline. Yes, I mean, I just like to pick up on that point. It's, I think that's a really good differentiation to make between large, controllable, synchronous hydro that Norway is very fortunate to have, um, but most countries sadly don't have that mm -hmm. resource. And certainly in GB, the renewables growth we're seeing is smaller, non-synchronous, perhaps uh, generation that our system operator doesn't see. Now, um, translating this, what this means is that we have a less state or increasingly having a less stable system. Um, in the past, if we lost a large power station, we'd have about seven seconds to correct the problem. Now, we ha only have about three and a half seconds, and that's continuing to mm -hmm. decrease. Um, in the first three months this year alone, uh, over two and a half gigawatts of uh, solar was installed in GB. And when you're, a country's minimum demand is maybe only around 15, 20 gigawatts, to have two and a half come on in three months is a, is a real right. shift. So yeah, we are seeing uh, increasing system operation problems in right. GB. So there's a coordination problem, of course, right? Yes. You might say that those making government policy don't have to deal with the system operation challenges, so aren't perhaps uh, tuned into them. But you know, this isn't to say it's possible. If we look uh, across to Ireland, they're already at a high renewable penetration to us. They're at 50%. They're running consultations and running a work program to go up to 75%. So it is possible to be done. Uh, you know, it's technically possible to go to 100% renewables but you sort of have to ask yourself at what cost, and there are some really interesting market questions about how you support generators that might be essential to keeping the system stable, but might have very low and unprofitable running hours. And then you also have to ask at what security supply are your customers prepared to have. At the moment, we're, most European countries are very fortunate we have a very high quality of supply. But to get the last sort of five, 10%, of, uh, of um, performance, of reliability, you have to spend an increasing amount. So if as consumers we're prepared to accept worse supply... I don't think so. I don't think well, that's true. But the, I mean, I don't think they will. But so that's kind of like the dirty little secret in some ways is that, you know, you have to power the base load. And so oftentimes that can be very dirty, especially if you don't have nuclear facilities at, at your disposal anymore, I guess is one way of putting it. But so that's that goes back to the question of variability and the the, the idea of um, in one case, you know, the duck curve. So solar is stealing the peak and then now there's a, an evening ramp up, um, can't control when the wind's going to blow. So it's this variability of the resource, which impacts uh, the technology, creates these technology challenges, which then is impacting the economics. It's just not the spot market pricing, for example, going into negative territory. But for example, say we want to take some, some um, areas off of diesel, 
you know, then then we need to put in we need to put in battery storage, right? But that may be too expensive for them, so they're never even getting off that diesel. And I don't think this is very well known. It's not just a case of slapping on these solar panels or bringing, you know, putting turbines here and there. I mean, there's all there's also all kinds of infrastructure issues too. Um, so. So now that we've done these projects, some of these major projects, you know, of course, Germany being the leading example, what, are, what have we learned that we don't want to repeat? What, what do we want to do? Let's start with the, how we finance these things, because the financing schemes are now coming fast and furious, and they're actually going to be controlling a lot of what we're able to do. Yeah. I mean, I guess when we look at the German example, then, 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 then probably what the German government has tried to correct is sort of the uncontrolled growth of renewables. Um, I guess uh, Germany has been a leading example of building out renewables and they've done a great job but at a certain point uh, the government felt that they lost a bit like control about like, like over that growth. Um, so if you can't really add those renewables in a, in a sort of a plant and a structured uh, way um, then you're going to have issues with your grid management, uh, with your conventional generators. And then obviously, I mean, uh, the whole Energiewende, which is supposed to be an example of how uh, like a, a big industrialized economy can move uh, like fully renewable, or like sort of at least kind of largely renewable, then, then that kind of fails. And that, that would be a big issue um, because a lot of countries are looking at Germany. Well, Remy, do you agree with what he's saying about the, not to interrupt you, but I want to get his response to that. We cannot, as, as a DSO, we cannot go against the renewable. This is, first, this is a chance for the grid to have new resources, distributed resources connected to the grid. But if we have a look at the situation in France, 95% of the renewables are connected to the distribution grid. And this grid has been designed a long time ago to support the, the winter peak load. It means uh, 8 p.m. So, we have the, this grid, strong, reliable, and, and, and cost-efficient, but designed on that way. And now, if you look at the French Riviera, not too far from Nice, in the middle of the afternoon, in, in summer, we have so many renewables connected that there is a huge difference between the generation, the local one, and the local consumption. For us, as a distribution system operator, it means voltage uh, disturbance. Mm -hmm. So, we have those renewables, this is a chance, but in the meantime, thanks to the renewables, or thanks is probably not the right, the right yeah. word, we are facing some uh, distribution grid congestion, which is quite new because the grid has been designed just to avoid those, uh, those congestion. Right. In terms of finance, we uh, as DSO have two options. The first one is a classic one, the, f the famous uh, copper investments. Change everything, new transformers, new cables. That's quite expensive and, mm -hmm. and, and it means also a lot of uh, disturbance for the, for the customers. If you start to, to dig all the streets to change the cable, it's both expensive, people are not very happy and it's probably not the best way. And the second option is to go smart and to, 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 to start to deploy smart equipment smart uh, apps and, and, and smart everything, especially to change the, or to, to change the customers' behaviors or to, to make the, the customers a bit more uh, involved in the uh, electricity market. We call that from consumer to prosumer. Sure. But the infrastructure, especially the distribution grid, is, is really the cornerstone of that. And in Germany, that's exactly the case. The, the, after the, or during the energy vendor, the, the problem or the issues that goes to the to the go to the to the distribution grid. Eh? If you ask RVE, that's quite a, that's quite a, yeah. a challenge for them to to manage that. So but is we that need to be careful of to the, the state of the grid mm. anytime. And is that a role of the DSO? And uh, sorry, Carol, I don't no, want to take please. over. But is that is that a role of the, the DSO to incentivize, for example, the the end consumer or sort of the the, the person with a, a solar PV on the rooftop um, to to kind of kind of uh, align its consumption with its auto generation. I mean, do you see that in the role of, of your company to do that? Or is that sort of like, do you bring in sort of competition, other companies to do that? 
We, we don't have a, a clear answer now. We are yeah. testing different uh, business model in the, in the, in the, demo, the demo we are doing, in, in, especially in France. But if we keep in mind that we are in charge of the security, the reliability of the grid, yeah. we have a, a key role to play, even with the, with the customers, to be sure that the balance and the local balance between generation and production will be good enough to avoid uh, voltage disturbance, or to well, avoid... But, uh, but, but you both have raised an interesting question that I think Julian might have a good uh, take on, which is the customer piece, though, too, right? What? Well, What's please, really interesting listening to both of you have heard about system operation challenges and network yeah. challenges and it's perhaps, I don't know if it's reassuring or worrying, but we're having exactly the same conversations in GB and Ireland as well. Um, just to pick up on your point about uh, incentive, is it the role of the DSO to incentivize customers? We're, we're having this debate now in GB. Um, one thing, we, I guess there are two ways to do it. I, in an ideal world, you want your new generators and your customers to connect to areas of the network where there's capacity and operate at market times when the energy is needed. Now on that former point, we only have a single market. We haven't yet gone to nodal pricing. So there's no locational signal or very few locational signals from the market. But network charging is becoming increasingly locational and dependent by time of day. So your DSO now charges generators different amounts at different times of day to reflect, and in different locations, to reflect the impact. I think we're sort of perhaps at risk of you know, talking about all the problems, and I think what's really interesting is we are facing huge challenges, but we're also, um, we've also got a really interesting array of tools that are gonna help mm -hmm. us fix the problem. We've got increased interconnection with countries, the European Commission has, uh, said they set out that they want countries to share reserves more. So instead of each country holding all the right. reserves it's need, each country sh you know, shares an element of their reserves so you overall hold less. And at a more local level, we're seeing tools, we're seeing renewable generators offer more ancillary services. They have the technical capability, it just needs the market structure now. Uh, and we're seeing completely new technologies, or I say new technologies, technologies that are commercially viable for the first time like storage that are now offering sub-second frequency response. So we're seeing some really interesting challenges, market challenges, system operation challenges, and network challenges, but we're also getting a really interesting right. set of tools We to do help have us. great tools, but you know, one of the things I think we need some simple clarity around too is what is the path forward in, in terms of getting to 100% so that we can manage these and get new tools and advancements and figure out the right um, solutions as we move forward. So there, you know, there are a couple of things. I mean, there's utility scale, um, you know, PV or wind. Yep. There's, uh, you know, community aggregation. There's rooftop and all of those require, they're, they're all different ownership schemes. They're all different financing schemes. Um, some of them require different forms of debt. What is the right, what should we be encouraging to move forward? And this goes back to the question of subsidies because that's how we pull those levers, right? So from a technical perspective, how do we move forward? Do we want the rooftops all full of solar or do we want to try to go to utility scale, which then has uh, other expenses related like infrastructure? Who wants to go first on that one? That's not an easy one and I'd love to know the answer. I guess I mean on the and and, and, and I can start and, and, and you guys you guys have a, will have a better ideas but um, if you talk about sort of the mix of renewables uh, and like should we have like rooftop or large scale and like how do you go about that then um, I think it's a it's a tricky one because there's sort of European um, regulations there that that sort of like probably prevent you from from like picking and choosing technologies but too much. Um, okay. So I think that's probably probably something to keep in mind. Although the UK is kind of like bypassing that a little bit and, and, and sort of uh, going around that a bit. Um, so it sounds like maybe what you're saying is that maybe more regional, than for a variety of reasons, and that could be technical and what it, wherever you're you are in terms of sun, wind, the right mm. the right thing to be doing, because we're we're certainly not putting you know turbines on our roofs, so. Well, what do you think, Remy? I think that if we want to go to 100% renewable or distributed renewable, we, we, we have to keep in mind, or at least to agree, on the quality of supply. 
if we go for 100% solar panel, that could be fine. But do we agree as customers to, to, to accept, uh, let's say, uh, not a, a bad, but uh, a not as good as, as today, a quality of supply? If the answer is yes, it will be a bit uh, less But how tricky. could it be yes, right? I mean, it's to us, like a, an electron is fungible and it's always there and we don't care where it comes as we from. Are that's, as a consumer, a, that's what I'm we thinking. We are in the digital area. Uh, I yeah. fully agree. It cannot be yes. So if we <laughs> want to keep the, the same quality of supply with something more local, with uh, distributed uh, energy, yeah. it means that uh, on an infrastructure perspective, we will have to increase or to put more uh, smart and, and brand new equipments on the grid. Those equipments are, are quite, uh, quite expensive, even if it's going better and better and better. If we look at the storage, that's, that's crazy. All the, all the prices are going down, but it's still quite, uh, quite expensive. And it's a new cost, an additional cost. And so this is a paradox, right? It's a, I mean, and you raise, you're the one that opened this can of worms for us, right? So, <laughs> so really, if I wanted to take it a step further, it sounds like, well, if we go to 100% renewables, things will be broken. Things just won't be as good as they used to be, but they'll be cleaner. So is it that extreme? I wouldn't say it's that extreme. I, from a supply point of view, you can always just spend more. So at, at the moment, I think today, yes, we can go to much higher penetration of renewables. I, if you want evidence, say look at Ireland. They're already at 50% and they're a really small electricity system. So if they can do it, a much larger... They also don't have this experience with quality, right? So the expectation is different. And they haven't seen, uh, you know, they haven't seen their, their quality of supply decrease. Right. Now, if Ireland can do it, then continental Europe that has a much larger, more stable system should certainly be able to do it. And as costs come down of equipment, as costs come down of the tools you need to move closer and closer to 100%, like storage is a classic example, and as we learn more about complementary forms of renewables, so you would never put oil rigs in one basket and go just solar, you go solar and wind and geothermal and hydro. As we learn more about that, then yes, I think it is in, it, we will increasingly be able to get closer and closer at a cost that is acceptable. Well, well so think, we, uh, uh, go ahead. I mean, yeah. uh, that, that probably, I mean, we, we should probably discuss as well, like, well, 100%, do we really want that? Right? So that was exactly what I was going to say. Um, is that even the right question? It, and if it's not, let's find out what the right one is. Well, so I think an interesting example is, uh, is the French government. They released, uh, of them uh, released a study on 100% renewables and like how like France 100% uh, renewable uh, French system would look like. And I think what, what is, I mean, very interesting finding from that report is that you can easily sort of like go from 40% to 70%, maybe over 90% of renewables, um, and it wouldn't increase costs that much. But then to go the last 5%, you need to add like ridiculous amount of storage, uh, a lot, which is yeah. like power to gas because it has to be seasonal storage mm -hmm. to serve that winter peak, which is especially like especially um, uh, high in, in in France. So so you end up like spending so much money in the last 5%. Um, to reduce emissions by actually not like that much, um, whereas that you could probably spend that money sort of to try to reduce emissions where it's a little bit cheaper. So um, I think I think the hundred percent is kind of a nice kind of thought exper experiment, but um, but I don't think it would be sort of like a cost-effective way for us to to, to kind of move forward. Um, really. But is it cost-effective to to just say, well, the levelized cost of energy for installed solar? We want it to be the same as, uh, you know, some you know dirty generation. Is that the right way to think about it? Is that the right way to push it forward? I have my doubts, and I I hear yeah. you saying let's be more holistic in our thinking. It's all about the system system impact, right? Yes, on a levelized basis. I, I think Remy would agree with you. And, uh, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I guess. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Currently, what we what we must do as as a as a DSO is to do our best to increase the uh, renewable hosting capacity of the existing, uh, existing, on the existing grid. And we need to keep the grid as good as possible, or as good as today, and to better host the renewables. As you exactly mentioned, when we increase the, the share of renewable locally, then we can reach 
a threshold, and after this, we could we need it. We will need probably a really, really high and expensive cost to, to keep it uh, as uh, as today. So this is probably not right. the best solution, but to increase the hosting capacity, we are doing that in on a, on a daily basis. Huh? The, the renewables are growing like this in France, like in Germany, like in in Spain or Italy, and we need to keep the system. Uh, as good as possible, or as good as today, or, or even better. Mm. Just we are working on the hosting capacity every yeah. single day with smart equipment, new equipment, mm. and storage could be. We are testing some storage facilities in the south of France, and that, that could help. That could help for sure. So, so Julian, do you do you think this is the right question? Should we be racing towards a hundred percent renewable? Your penetration, I mean, is that the right question or is that diverting us from what we should be focusing on to actually get there sooner or later? But we need a lot of storage, so uh, I guess yeah. I'm say that. <laughs> That's right, he's happy with that. Yeah. I, I think what I'd say is we've talked about there are going to be increased market costs and there are going to be increased network costs, but what this really ends up in is increased costs to consumers. So there is a really important societal question there. If you make your bills more expensive, you put more people in fuel poverty. So how do you balance that? How, how do you balance your ambition to go more renewables versus adversely impacting people? So yes, I think we should certainly have more renewable ambition than we do now. The tools are now commercially there, um, and, and we understand how to operate the networks better, and how to operate the system. There will need to be some market changes. So. I think the important question is 100% renewables is kind of a, a nice headline, but as we've heard, there may be a level slightly below that, not far below that, but just slightly below that, which is actually much more achievable in the near term. And I wouldn't want to, to have a discussion focusing on 100% renewables, what are the costs, if it detracts from the much more realistic option of getting to a it's, much it's like 95% renewables point, in the short yeah. term. Because listen, if you go out to the public and say, we can, we we, we want clean, you know, clean energy. This is our goal, 100%. The costs are going to go up. And on the other hand, you have um, the ability to get solar financed through a solar provider with with your own residential storage, and the payoff is, I guess, uh, I did uh, the calculation on my own home. I think the payoff was going to be 12 years, something mm -hmm. like that. And my, my rates are pretty darn low because um, I'm in New England. So it's, literally, I pay six cents. If, if I could just jump in a point you picked up that's really interesting that we haven't really discussed is the political and public perception. I mean, e energy that's, is yeah. a really political topic. And I cannot foresee any government um, accepting a situation where security supply decreases. I mean, I think that would be political so suicide. I mean, our economy rests on that security. Absolutely. And yeah. I, I mean, I've, I've seen in my time in government the ability of press headlines to completely misunderstand and misrepresent a story and, and you know, re reflect it in a really bad light. So this goes back to the point of I feel that if we aim for this, if we have a conversation about 100% renewables, it will be so easy for lots of people to pull up so many barriers about, oh, there'll be horrific costs, power quality will go down. So let's focus on a, a realistic target that, as we heard from the French government report, may only be 5% lower, but I think that should be the conversation we're having rather than 100%. Well, I don't know how we reframe that, but I think we really, really have to, mm -hmm. because for a lot of the economic um, topics we've talked about, the fact that costs are going up for infrastructure because of this need for security reliability, I mean, the lights have to go on. Uh, we, we also have to keep in mind the, uh, the HR uh, challenge. As much as we increase the, the part of renewable of the grid, and if we start to uh, deploy smart equipment, storage and a new system, we are also increasing the complexity of the grid. Right. And we need uh, the right skills. In the, across all the industry, not only at the DSO level, but across the industry, we need the right skills to manage this new complexity. And at the end, mm. this new complexity brings more cost. Not only uh, the cost of the equipment, but the, the cost of maintenance, the cost of the, for all the operation, and we need the skills. And currently, it's uh, the equipments are here, 
storage batteries are existing, but when we put and connect the batteries to the grid or new equipment to the grid, the, we raise the complexity of the grid and we need the right people to manage at DSO level to uh, maintain at the uh, equipment uh, manufacturer level and, uh, we, and, uh, and that we need to, um, to involve in this, uh, in this way the universities, the research center and everything to mm -hmm. be sure that in the future we will have the right uh, skills available for that. Okay. Could, could I just res respond to that? To that? Um, sure. We've seen this in the UK as we've had more, you know, we had a lot of wind put on and our system operator said, well, this is going to increase the complexity, we'll need more people. But what we actually see in reality is you, they just learn about it and actually they, you, they get really good. Um, it used to be the case that it said, well, we won't be able to forecast wind, we're going to have huge imbalance costs. And now four hours out, we can forecast wind with huge accuracy. So whilst there may be short-term complexity for network operators, I don't think that's a long-term challenge because people learn and people adapt. I fully agree and, with that. Yeah. And if you walk around the, here today, I've seen so many systems that help with energy management and integration. So I don't see it necessarily as a large uh, human resource problem. We will learn how to do it, as we have repeatedly done in the past as the system has changed. I think, well, I, I do I think do there's <laughs> domain it, there's domain knowledge that, uh, that I think maybe Remy's also getting to, which concerns me from um, an analytics perspective, you know, being able to derive the right conclusions. But one, one thing we haven't even talked about at all um, is the role of the consumer in this. So I think there's a big question, if we're moving to 100%, Renew, say this is our goal, 100%, as much as possible, let, let's call that our goal. Um, and we've already talked about the cost to the system, the complexities, uh, the amount of storage we might need. We've talked about the fact that the tariff for the consumer might go up. So where does this leave questions of energy efficiency and demand response? I'm, I think that's a, a very confusing topic when you think about all that grease on, right? Well, I think on, on, on top of sort of like thinking about like higher tariffs and higher base load prices, or if, if, if think about that, then we, we also have to think about a volatility. Um, with more renewables in the grid, you need to remunerate that flexible capacity, and like one way to really do it is to allow prices to go really high at the time where you need that flexible capacity. Mm -hmm. um, so I think for the end consumer, and at least the customer, if I think about like sort of large industrial uh, user, um, Maybe the, the, the sort of the end consumer, uh, the households will be shielded from that a little bit more, but they, they will need to get used to a much more volatile uh, energy market. And, and I think it's, it's the view of the commission even, like they say, well, if we go, if we want to build out renewables, we just have to accept that volatility. Um, and that might actually mean that prices go, in the wholesale market, go extremely high at certain moments, like, like plus thousands of euros. So, I mean, that, that kind of, mm -hmm. that kind of uh, dimension. Or, but that, that kind of um, that kind of prices, and I, I think that's probably something that we're not prepared for yet. I mean, we need to see what happens when prices actually go that high, and what the sort of the, the political reaction to that is. I, um, I would because think large companies will complain. And I think you'll also see a stressing uh, movement towards defection, yeah. a grid defection as well. I mean, we just have a few minutes left, so let's let's have you address that. Quickly, what is your strategy for the consumer in a high the penetration consumer, scenario? If we, if we go to the in the street, ask and we, if we ask the citizen, do we want to do, do you do you want do we want to go to 100% renewables? That we probably say yes. If in the meantime we say that, uh, just be careful or keep in mind that it will uh, uh, increase the cost of the uh, electricity. It's and what are we what are we be, willing will be to yes pay? as well, but okay. in, in, a, in a smaller part. And then if we say that. To manage that, it means that you will have to change dramatically your behaviors and the way you use the electricity. I'm not sure we will get a yes for, it's a, for it's granted. A, in, in it's a, a point the, we don't like to talk about, right? In the French demo, when we try to involve the customers, we, we, they want to play with us the, the flexibility game, but they don't want to spend too much time uh, trading their own electricity or changing everything in their life just to cope with the, the, the balance of generation and, and production of and uh, consumption. They want yeah. to play, but they don't want to play too much. Right. They, they have a lot of other things in mind and just playing with the phone and trading electricity intraday to be sure. It's fun for a little bit. But Julian, what are your final thoughts for us on this? On the, I think consumers are, are going to be, play an increasingly important role in the future. 
Historically, we've just treated it as an uncontrollable demand and tried to match generation. If we're going to get towards this high renewable penetration, we're going to have to involve the people who use it so that they change their use, to, especially as we go to using more and more natural resources like uh, wind and solar. Smart meters, uh, it's, it's, you know, something we haven't yet discussed, but that's going to be a key tool. Is, you know, the smart meters have to work, they'll have to give clear pricing information to customers so they can easily change their use. And we're just going to have to make it easier for consumers to engage. They've been kept at arm's length for most of the time. But what's really refreshing walking around, like going to the Nest stand, is seeing, um, seeing products that increasingly engage the consumer in managing their energy. So I think this is a really interesting development and we'll have to see yeah, how it develops. I think it, it better be done right because uh, we haven't even discussed this the, all of these things in the context of, of the potential of massive, massive defection from the grid, which changes lots and lots of things, especially the economics. So one thing I have learned from you gentlemen today is that the quest for 100% renewable penetration may very well be the wrong question to get that outcome anyway. That may not be the right goal. There may be a better way to go about it. So. I, I really appreciate your time. I learned a lot today, and I, I think we covered some, some good ground. Uh, so this is Carol Stimmel in the Engerati studio. Uh, thank you for joining us today at European Utility Week 2015.